Ready? Okay. Welcome to Binary Ninja versus Ida Pro, or I think I had a different title originally in it, Using Binary Ninja to Attack Modern Malware. We weren't, my uh, associate and I, Josh Trochheim, we weren't exactly sure what to call it. Basically, we wanted to do a little investigation in uh, this new reverse engineering tool called Binary Ninja. Just to play with it, figure it out, and see how it works, and see if it's as good as the kind of reigning champion, which of course, if you know anything about reverse engineering, the, re the reigning champion is Ida Pro. So let me give you a little background in case you're not familiar with reverse engineering and you know that whole scene. I know everybody comes to these conferences with very different levels of experience. Some of you are maybe master reverse engineers and some of you maybe haven't really heard a lot about it and kind of want to learn a little something about it. So there's at least three main reasons you might want to reverse engineer code. Probably the most prevalent reason is malware analysis. So and, and particularly on the Windows environment, right? I know some of the Linux people out there and embedded systems people probably, you know, don't think much of that. But the fact is, Microsoft still owns about 80% of the enterprise. And if you're writing commodity malware, ransomware, or, you know, the sort of the run-of-the-mill junk, you're not going to write it for some obscure system that has like 0.01% of the market, right? Probably. You might if you're a nation state and you're going after automobiles or, you know, you definitely might. But... Generally, a lot of the garbage malware and stuff we see, it's written for Windows, and it's kind of the commodity stuff. So reverse engineering for malware analysis, particularly to kind of look at all the daily stuff, so to speak, that's the most common use case. And I've actually got a class on Pluralsight, which if you haven't heard of, it's an online training company um, called Advanced Malware Analysis Combating Exploit Kits. And I go over distribution, landing, exploit kits, payloads, effects, IOCs, tracking, cleanup, all that stuff. If you want to like take a deep dive course into that, we're not going to get that deep into malware analysis today. In fact, this talk is not really about how to do malware analysis. It's more about comparing a couple of tools. Since one of them is so new, a lot of people haven't heard of it. The other reason you might do malware analysis is for vulnerability research, or uh, reverse engineering, I'm sorry, is for VR, basically. And that's a pretty common thing. So if you're hunting for bugs, you're looking for vulnerabilities, you're trying to write exploits, all of that stuff, especially, obviously, against closed source systems, you got to reverse engineer the code. Um, a great example that's hot right now is car hacking. You might have to reverse engineer the firmware, dump it off, reverse it, figure out how it works, figure out what messages it sends to the CAN bus, whatever it may be. And you could do that for any system, right? SCADA, cars, Windows, Linux, it doesn't matter. That whole thing uh, works across the board. The third reason you might do reverse engineering, and this actually happens more than people might think, is developers actually do it, believe it or not. A lot of times they're developing some low-level thing, like, uh, you know, kind of a low-level kernel driver or something like that, and there's a lot of closed-source APIs that they might want to have access to, and they might not be well-documented. And so it's kind of a nightmare. It's sort of a developer's worst-case scenario that they actually have to go ahead and reverse engineer some you know, a driver or whatever, DLL or something to try to figure out how an API even works. It's not ideal, but it does actually happen more than you think, particularly in the security space. If you're writing antivirus engine, something like that, a lot of times you're touching parts of the system that really shouldn't, most people aren't touching. For, I mean, a good example of that would be if you're writing a hardware driver, you're interfacing sort of in well-known paths, plug and play, how to print, that sort of thing, very cool. But if you're writing an AV engine, it's a software driver. You're not really touching any hardware, and so you have to touch parts of the filtering stack and stuff that it's well-documented, but maybe not in every case. So it's a little different. So that's kind of the why. Today's learning is, um, again, trying to figure out how good is this new tool, how does it compare to IDA, and let's take a peek at it with an example. So I kind of call it IDA Pro, and that's their old icon for the reverse engineering tool Ida Pro. It's been around forever. That's, you know, that's her, that beautiful lady right there. I remember at least talking to one of my reverse engineering friends, and he said, you know, your life is kind of sad when the only lady you've seen in two weeks is the reverse engineering lady. Like the, you know, it is what it is, right? So anyway, Binary Ninja is a newer tool. Uh, it's written by a friend of mine, Jordan Wines. He runs a company called Vector35 down in Melbourne, Florida, and he's got a few guys he works with. And they're doing some really cool stuff. And they decided, because they do a lot of vulnerability research to write their own tool, they wanted to create something that was a little faster, a little cheaper, a little more flexible for the kind of work they do. And so when he told me about it, I was like, that's really exciting. I want a demo. Like, let me have a beta version. I'll give it a try. And we'll take a work uh, and see, you know, how it works. So 
the other thing I want to do in this talk is kind of a call to action. Like, you can do it. You can do it. Or however that guy says it, right? You can, you can go out there and try it. I encourage you to, you know, get involved with uh, either tool. They have demos for both IDA and Binary Engines, so you can, you know, uh, take the code sample that I'm going to show you at the end. We put it up on GitLab. You can grab that. You can download it. You can play with it in both, and you can kind of get a sense for how they work on your own. So who am I? Um, my name's Jared DeMott. I've been around this scene for a long time, 16 years. Um, I work for Binary Defense Systems. I'm the CTO of the uh, next-gen software product called Vision. Uh, that we're creating there. That's my day job. And I do a lot of other things too. Um, I do a lot of training, like at Black Hat and other conferences through my VDA labs, uh, and other stuff too. And I've got a few, um, guys that I kind of partner with on a lot of this. Um, Josh Strohshine, he's a professor at DSU, and he does, uh, helps me with stuff, and he does part-time malware analysis for Bromium. And so a lot of these folks are pretty busy, as well as another associate of ours, um, Joshua Blake. So that's kind of who we are. So let's talk about Binary Ninja. What does it do? Well, it does a lot of the things that you'd expect any disassembler to do. So you take a fully compiled program, typically written in C, C++, some other language like that. Could be compiled for x86, 64-bit x86, could be compiled for ARM, 32 or 64-bit, whatever it may be. And again, there's that reason that you might want to reverse it. You stick it in the disassembler, and you have to look at the assembly <clears throat> and there's a lot of interactive capability that is useful beyond that. Because looking at assembly is pretty painful. If you've ever, you know, move this in that register, move this value into that register, pop this register, push that register, jump, J, N, E, call, whatever. It's like, if you're really into assembly, it's, you know, it becomes more intuitive, but it's not so intuitive from the get-go. So how do you get into it? How do you sort of immerse yourself in it? Well, first you need to learn the language that it was originally written in, right? So if you're not a C programmer, the chance that you're going to be able to understand assembly is sort of unlikely. So probably you want to learn a little bit about the original language that it's written in first, and then you can learn the architecture, which there's whole like semester courses at college on architecture, computer architecture. You can learn about that. Um, but there's hope if you're not a programmer to be able to use some of these tools too. And that's why these tools like Ida Pro and, and Binary Ninja now are so popular because they make that sort of work accessible to someone who may not be a programmer. For example, they have a strings window so you can see all the strings that are in the binary even if you don't really understand the assembly. They can sometimes do things like decompile, like go a step further than disassemble. Ida has a decompiler so it can try to translate the assembly back to C which makes it more readable with the if this, else that, that sort of logic. Um, and Binary Ninja has sort of half of that. They have an intermediate representation that gives you a little bit of the logic that's a little higher level than the assembly, but they haven't actually built a decompiler yet. And so that's what we'll talk about, kind of comparing and contrasting some of the different features that make these tools so useful and accessible in a different level. Um, obviously, one of the first things people want to know is, well, what does it cost? Okay. And the Binary Ninja model is pretty straightforward. There's a demo. Obviously, they both have a demo for free. You can try it. Uh, Binary Ninja has a $99 model um, for personal and a professional for $400. And that's quite a bit cheaper than IDA, if you've ever looked at pricing out IDA. So, you know, BN or Binja, or however I keep, I might shorten it instead of saying Binary Ninja every time. I just say Binja or BN. That's a little cheaper, for sure. So that's, you know, that's one in theirs. It's a little easier to understand, too. If you've ever looked at the pricing model for IDA Pro, you go to the website, you try to read a bunch of stuff, you read some more stuff to try to figure out what zone you're in and if you need a named or a type, and at the end, you're scratching your head going, huh, uh, which one do I need? It's kind of confusing, and it's kind of expensive, but eventually you'll figure out that you can buy it for one architecture, so you can buy it for Windows. Like, Binja works on whatever it works on. It's, written, it's all written in Python, so it'll run in, in Mac or Windows or Linux, so you don't have to buy a separate version for each. You can run it either. Where either you have to buy it for the one you want to run it in. And then you can either get a named or a floating, and there's different extensions. You can get pro or, or standard, and you can, get, you can add on the decompiler. But by the time you're all done, you might be up to, say, $3,000. So it's definitely an order of magnitude more expe expensive. Excuse me. So there's that. Some people don't care about that. Some people do, you know, depends on where you're at. So the interface um, are fairly similar. 
Benja's got kind of more of that hacker look, that sort of dark background look, and where Ida's is white by default, but you can customize that in Ida. So the look and feel is sort of, eh, I take that with a grain of salt, because you can customize that either way. And basically, you just take your executable or your DLL or whatever it is you want to reverse, and just drop it on. You can just open the GUI and drop it in there, and it'll start disassembling. For either one, they both work the same way in that regard. So that works. They both have a linear disassembly view, so you can just look at the assembly, kind of one instruction at a time. They both have a hex view if you want to get just the data. And they both have a graph view, and you can switch back and forth between them pretty easily. You just hit the space key on your keyboard, and you can switch between graph and flat view. So that's pretty standard stuff that you expect out of your reverse engineering tool. That's why these tools are better than just looking at the hex in an editor or some, you know, raw form or something, because these tools give you the ability to zoom in and zoom out on the graphs, and you can add comments, and you can rename functions. In either one of them, a lot of the hotkeys are the same. You can hit N, rename a function to like, oh, I think I know what this does. It's the crypto or whatever. So that interactive, that's what IDA stands for, the interactive disassembler. That interactiveness is really what makes the difference. Um, in Binja, the strings window is down at the very bottom. You click down there and you can pop up another menu and you can find the strings window from there. So um, one thing that's nice about Binja that's slightly different than Ida is you can have multiple programs inside the same main window and they show up as different tabs in Binja. So it doesn't quite work yet, but in the long run, what their view for that tool is if you have an executable that depends on 10 or 20 different DLLs, you could put them all in the same project and there would even be some cohesion there. Where with IDA, you have to basically open up each DLL or executable as a separate program window, which is not really a big deal, but it's just kind of one of those subtle differences that you'll see. The log window and output is pretty similar. They both have an area at the bottom of the disassembler where you can get output if you're running a script or if there's an error when it opens it or anything like that. You'll see that in a very similar way. They both have a, a scripting window. Uh, the uh, IDA is just kind of a small sliver of an interactive. If you want to run Python kind of on the fly, that's one of the cool things that um, any good interactive disassembly tool is going to allow you to do, which is to extend it with your own code. So you can write Python extensions to whatever you can imagine. Search the entire thing for certain instruction or whatever you need to do as a reverse engineer that might be tedious to do manually, you can automate it through scripting. And that's the way of the future for everything, by the way. If you guys haven't noticed, it's a little bunny trail talking about that. But automation, right? We see it in DevOps. We see it in IT operations. We see it everywhere. Everything's being like, let the robots do the easy stuff, as Paul Nelson said yesterday when I was talking. I think he was the one that said that. I, I like that. It was catchy. Let the robots do the easy stuff. So anyway, um, we want to be able to extend our tools as well. Um, so auto analysis is what happens when you throw the executable into the tool. It has to plug and chug and do a lot of hard work to try to pull it all apart. It's a really complicated thing. It's basically the opposite of what a compiler does. So I don't know if you've ever, you know, looked at the source code for like GCC or a compiler or something, but it's fairly complex. What a compiler is a whole study of uh, in academia called compiler theory, right? It's a, it's a non-trivial area of expertise. And it's kind of the same with this. Decompiling is that same idea of let me take all these raw instructions, bytes as they were, and try to pull them back and figure out what the original logic of this program was and piece it together and do a lot of extra things like figure out, oh, there's debug symbols. I can pull those in and automatically rename things for you. And, oh, here's the imports that it uses and the DLLs that it depends on. And these are the, thing, the functions that it exports. And all of that kind of stuff is part of the auto analysis. And the binary ninja one's very fast. They have a very uh, well-threaded, well-thought-out architecture that makes their analysis very fast. It's not as thorough, though. And the reason for that is, when you look at Ida Pro, it's been in existence and being heavily used in our industry for like 20 years. Binge has been selling for about three months now. So, you know, it is what it is, right? It's cheaper and stuff like that. It's a great tool. You know, everything, it's good. But the, the sort of the, the too long didn't read if you fall asleep halfway through me talking about this is it's a great tool. Totally recommend you try it. It's not quite as full featured yet. And you would expect that, right, out of a company and a tool that's so new. So no surprise on that, I wouldn't think. Uh, when you look at the hotkeys, like you can type G and then type an address, and you'll jump right to that location in the binary. So uh, one of the things that these tools do for you is they're basically like a loader, right? So all the virtual addresses that map to the assembly instructions are corresponding and show 
they may or may not be the address that the program really runs at, depending on if ASLR or whatever is in play. But if it's not, that'll actually be the address that it runs at. So you can jump to that address and do whatever investigation. You can hit end to rename, um, comments, procedures, all that good stuff. And one of the things that's kind of cool, here's a little video, renaming a function to this and then deciding, oh, I didn't want to rename that. You can hit basically Control-Z or Apple-Z on, on a Mac and undo that. It's not a real exciting feature to be able to undo a little thing, but Ida has never had that in 20 years. They've never had the ability to undo something. So the BN folks thought that they would add at least something for sure that, that they don't have. So they have an undo feature, which is, uh, I would say, helpful. And they both have what's called cross-referencing, and that's a really important thing when you're doing reverse engineering, to be able to tell that, oh, this function it's called from these 10 places. You might want to do that for a lot of reasons. Think about vulnerability analysis, for example. If there's a, if there's a dangerous API like stircopy or sprintf or something, you can, you could quickly walk those cross references, find out all the locations that that dangerous API, API is used in and audit that code and potentially find a vulnerability in short order if you know what you're doing. So having the ability to do cross references is really important. They both have that ability. I think IDAS is probably a little more full featured, but it is what it is. And this is where you'll really see some of the more full-featuredness of IDA. When you just simply load a program into both of them, you'll notice that typically um, Binja is not always finding main. So that's a really interesting and important thing that's helpful. It kind of, it's one less thing you have to do as a reverse engineer. Okay, so all like C programs or whatever it is, DLLs, DLLs have a DLL entry, kernel drivers have a, you know, an entry point as well. But most like C programs, they have a main function, right? And you want to start there because the user code that was programmed is going to be somewhere off main. But the compiler actually adds another function to main called start. And it calls main from start. And that's how command line arguments to the programs are pushed to main. You'll see like a push, push, push call to main or a move, move, move call. And um, Ida is pretty good at finding main for you. So typically it'll start you in the main routine and name it as well, like you're in main. So and in many cases, Binja will not do that. Um, so you, I don't know if you can read the screen or not up there behind me, but you'll see in some cases, you'll see like a call to sub underscore virtual address in Binary Ninja, where in Ida Pro you see a call to T main CRT startup or whatever. So it actually found main and you started inside of that. I backed out of it manually just so that you could see the function name and where it's called from start. But so the auto analysis is definitely more full featured, particularly as it relates to Windows stuff, because Ida's bread and butter is living on the Windows world where Jordan and his group, they do a lot of uh, vulnerability analysis and they do a lot of that on Linux and embedded systems and stuff like that. So they want to have Windows support and they have decent Windows support and everything like that, but it hasn't been their, like their core business like IDA has been. So when you put in a Windows binary into IDA, it's going to be pretty good at finding very subtle things. And here are some named items that it found. There's a there's this new feature in Windows 8 and Windows 10 called Control Flow Guard. I gave a talk about that last year at ShmooCon if you want to learn more about what Control Flow Guard is. Um, but Ida finds that. Basically, before a, what used to be just a single call and newly compiled, very, very new Windows binaries. It's been compiled with Visual Studio 2015 or newer. It only works on Windows 8 or 10. Basically, before every indirect jump, you'll see another call to check to see if the address of the call that's about to happen is a valid address. So they do basically pointer checking with something called Control Flow Guard. They're, they're guarding the control flow of your program, basically. Where if you look at on the left there, uh, Binary Ninja just sees it as a call D word data underscore some address. It doesn't, it's, it didn't auto recognize that that's the guard check I call F pointer, which is what it's called in MSDN terms. So the MSDN names are a little goofy, but Ida knows what they are. Okay, so, and you see that as well in the interface window. So for here, for example, Ida found like memcopy and stircopy and all the like library functions that this program was linked against. It often does a pretty good job if it can of finding that, where in this case you'd have to manually name those in Binja. You, you see that they're just called sub underscore virtual address. So they're not labeled. Which, you know, it's not hard to get over that. It's just one more thing. As a reverse engineer, you're like, you're like any little thing I don't have to do is good because it's kind of a p tedious, painful sort of task anyway. So if there's one less thing you have to do, that's a good thing. Uh, one place that Binja 
excels, and I, and I already mentioned this, is because of their uh, vulnerability research background, is they've done a really good job with patching, modifying binaries, changing binaries, adding shell code, anything sort of hackerish. They're pretty good at that because that's the kind of stuff that they've focused on. So being able to change the binary, you know, right within the graphical interface is something that you can do well in Binja. Uh, they've also taken a lot of time to um, represent the internal database as it is uh, of all the assembly instructions. Basically, that's how these tools work is they create a mapping between sort of the data bytes themselves and the instructions and what the, you know, the interactive database thinks about those so that it can do operations on them like walk cross references and have a list of all the subroutines and all that kind of stuff. They have what's called an intermediate language, an IL. And that's basically, without getting too technical, because now you're down into sort of the compiler theory if you really want to describe it and talk about it and get into the weeds, it's basically a slightly higher level representation of the assembly. And that gives you the ability uh, to do a number of things. It, it, it allows you to reverse engineer in a slightly more cross-platform manner. So if you're used to looking at x86 and suddenly somebody throws an ARM binary at you, normally it's like, oh crap, I don't know how to look at that. I don't know ARM, because the assembly is totally different. But if there's an IL involved, take a look, you'll see that normally like an x86, a jump looks like a JE, where the IL looks like an IF, because that's what a JE, it's jump if some condition, if, if something's equal, or JLE, JLG, jump if something's greater than, it's basically a conditional jump, a branch statement, if you will. And we write those in C as ifs. And so we'd like to be able to see that as an if, if possible, and you can do that with an IL. It's not a full decompiler, you still see some assembly in there, but some of the logic is in the IL form. And we see that same thing on the ARM, even though the assembly instructions, I don't know if you can read them again, you know, the, the, the assembly instructions look very different, but the branch still looks like an if when you look at the IL version of it. So that's quite helpful and quite useful. So one of the questions I get, People are like, oh, you're going to talk about Binary Ninja? Cool. What architectures does it support? Well, it supports x86 and ARM and MIPS and 6502. So they've got a number of things they support, which is great. That's a pretty good list. Those are the primary targets that people compile software for, for fully compiled native software. If you, on the other hand, look at the list of things that Ida supports, it's kind of ridiculously long. They support every weird architecture you can imagine. And I, I, I zoomed in on a few here because I thought they were humorous. They, you can, you can reverse engineer stuff that's been targeted for the Qualcomm Snapdragon, the Game Boy, the Fujitsu, all this weird architectures that like, I don't even know about, you know, right? Like, maybe I've heard of them, but they're not real common in every case, but Ida can disassemble them, which is pretty cool. Um, uh, to, to balance that, and to be fair, Binja could also uh, decompile them given another add-on. So basically, you'll have to write the, an extension, which is part of why they spent so much time engineering that IL, because writing the extension on top of the IL is, if you are pretty familiar with their stuff, relatively straightforward. And I say that in sort of a loose term, right, depending on how comfortable you are coding and stuff like that, right? Everybody comes from a different background. But if you're a coder, it's relatively easy to extend uh, to, to one of these other platforms and you know a lot about the architecture. All right, so let me um, give you a little example and talk about a little piece of malware. Because how do you compare two tools like this other than look and feel and price? So right now, as it is right now, we basically, we've talked features, we've talked look and feel, We've talked price, and you can use this sort of analysis. Some of you IT folks, can, you do this all the time, and you may not even realize it. You compare vendors all the time, right? You're like, well, this router has this feature, and this router has this feature, but this one costs this much. And so many people in IT are very used to doing this kind of analysis. So you can do it um, as we've done, basically based on features and, and price and everything like that. You can also do it with more of a lab test. And you might do that too in IT, right? You might actually try the router and throw a bunch of traffic at it and see if it rolls over or whatever type of equipment you're testing. That's kind of, we wanted to do that same sort of thing here. It's like, well, let's just take a little piece of malware and it doesn't have to be anything in particular. So we found a, a dropper. Uh, Josh and I both have access to malware a lot because we work with it, you know, for our day jobs sometimes. So we had a piece of malware handy. Yeah, that's the MD5 if you want to look it up on Virus Total. But there's nothing special about this malware. It's a fairly simple dropper, very run of the mill. And the problem with it, though, is a couple of things. First, most malwares come packed. So unpacking them is kind of a pain. 
And this is where Ida definitely is superior and rules the roost because it, it is able to run things. It can do it can do dynamic work in Ida. It basically includes a debugger and stuff like that. You can't do that at all in Binary Engine. It's all static analysis. And so a lot of the way that malware analysts get past the packer, instead of spending like three weeks of their life trying to reverse engineer the algorithm for the packer and the encryptor and stuff, they just run it to a certain point and then they stop it and then they dump it. Right, because it has to unpack itself to do anything useful in, in real life. So instead of trying to go after it purely statically, they use a combination of static and dynamic analysis. And that makes sense, right? You always want to like, let's just cut to the chase. If it if it has to unpack itself to run, I'll just wait till it does that, and then I'll grab the real inner binary that is the malware. Right? I don't want to spend time on the packer. So that had to be done first. So we did that so that we could look at them both fairly, and then we created a script that each tool could run statically to do the rest, kind of the rest of the work, or some, not really even the rest of the work, but some task within the process of malware analysis to kind of figure out which tool has a better plugin architecture, which one is it easier or harder to write an extension for, um, which one executes faster when the plugin is executed. That sort of thing uh, is what we wanted to do. And what it does is pretty common thing that a lot of malware, shellcode also does this, is basically they have a hash of an API. And so the way you call Windows functions within a shellcode or a malware a lot of times is they sort of dynamically resolve the APIs they want to call. So they may want to load a library. They might want to allocate memory. They may want to, you know, download something off the internet. They may want to use WinExec to execute something, whatever it is. They, those functions are not sort of directly embedded in the shellcode or the, or the malware. They're sort of dynamically resolved. They find the address of kernel 32 and then they walk the export table and then they uh, do some hashing stuff, decode a string that's basically the representation of the function they want and then they call that function. It's kind of just a common level of indirection, if you will. So that's what we decided to do for our problem was um, and, and the motivation for that is, of course, this is the inner dumped malware, which we call just dumped up in. If you just do a strings on it, you don't see any strings. You don't see that it calls virtual alloc. You don't see that it calls win exec. You don't see, and that's what you really want to know. And you could do this again dynamically. In fact, most malware analysts do this dynamically, in fairness. They put it in some kind of a sandbox cage. They let it run. They see what it does. It connects out to the internet, downloads stuff, and then they just capture the runtime analysis and they don't fiddle a whole lot with the static analysis because it's sort of needlessly complicating and, and needlessly time consuming. That's why if for a runtime analysis uh, is, is quite important for malware. Um, may or may not be the case for vulnerability analysis and that's why again this is a fair exercise and a fair you know sort of study because for vulnerability analysis you might do some dynamic execution, you might do fuzzing and all that kind of stuff, but it's in many cases to find the deeper, the buried bugs, some static analysis, some reversing of the internals really is needed to figure out how to even get going fuzzing and if it's truly closed source and stuff. So that was the motivation there. So uh, the problem is that when you look at the code statically, you'll see a bunch of indirect calls like call EAX. And it, does, it doesn't say call virtual alloc or call win exec or call whatever, which is what we want to see. We want to see what it's doing. So because it doesn't have that, we have to sort of uh, get that. So what is, in this case, EAX? How could we figure that out? Well, as I mentioned, probably one of the simplest ways is if you can run it dynamically like you can in IDA, you can actually just set a breakpoint on that call, run it to that point, and then look in memory, and you'll see that EAX if you can see it there, is actually kernel32 virtual alloc, for example. So dynamic analysis is quite useful. But we're sort of pretending for the sake of this exercise that we want to do it statically for both tools to give a, sort of a, a fair comparison. So how do we solve this statically? So if you look at the code, um, this approach of locating a DLL and then uh, res resolving a hash uh, with some internal algorithm and then calling that hash is a pretty common thing. And so we, we've seen this pattern in code before and we kind of have a good understanding of how it works. I'm not going to walk through all the details because I would absolutely put everyone to sleep and we'd be here for a while. So I'm going to skip you a lot of the very low level nitty gritty and kind of gloss over some of the details. But suffice it to say that we understand how this algorithm works. It works something like find the <clears throat> DLL name, find the export, create the hash, and you do that for however many functions you want to call. That's kind of the high level um, experience. Okay, cool. So, how do we write a plugin for 
Ida and for Binary Ninja. I'll show you a little bit about how to do that. So uh, typically you have to import, so it's in Python. That's a very common language in sort of the hacker space. Everybody writes stuff in Python, except which project, which shall not be named. The Metasploit project, they write everything in Ruby. So and there's probably other tools too that are useful that are written to something else. But many security tools are written in Python. And so your Python script, you're going to import like the IDA API, or in this case, Binary Ninja's API. And then at some point, you're going to call, uh, we call this plugin the Resolve API calls. It's not a very original name for the plugin, but that's what it does. So that's what we named it. So you can just right click inside of Binary Ninja and you can run that plugin. That's how that works. It's really straightforward. In the documentation for this, it's all online. It's fairly involved. Um, you'll definitely want to be sort of a plugin writer, coder type to make any sense of this at all. Uh, but if you want to go out there and dig into it, I definitely encourage you to do that. I've made our example source code and this malware sample and everything available online. You can go and check it out. So at this point, instead of me just talking, I'd like to stop and give you a little demo. See how I'm doing on time. I'm good on time. So what I've done is, uh, this is the script for Binary Ninja. This is what the actual uh, code looks like. And I've got a few hard-coded strings in there that if you want to run this, you'll have to change it on yours. So I'm sure this code could be improved, just for the record. It's not uh, meant to be sort of production quality, but it's a good test. And it's got all the code that includes um, the bits for hashing and API creation. And at least for Binary Ninja, the important part, and I'll go over this briefly at the end, this is sort of the important part of the code where we resolve the code. Um, and, and I'll talk through it kind of briefly in Slideware, but if, again, I mean, each one of these scripts is a few hundred lines, so I don't want to bore you to death. But this is the plugin code that we have from a high level for Binary Ninja. And this is the same code written for IDA. So we can see that we import IDC and IDA utilities instead of Binary Ninja. So you're importing some different libraries. And the code is going to be fairly similar at parts, especially the logic where you're, you know, dehashing the, uh, the data or, sorry, decoding it. Uh, the actual walking of the functions and stuff, it's a little bit different. Uh, Ida, Ida has this structure uh, where you walk the segments in an executable and then you walk all the functions with that and then you walk all the instructions in the function and then you can look for certain instructions like a call and then if you find the one you're looking for you can do whatever logic you have so it's it takes a little while how to, to learn how to write one of these plugins I, I, it's not like insanely complicated but it definitely if you've never done this you know it's and you, and you don't know Python and you're not a coder it might take you you know a couple weeks to come up to speed but it's definitely something that you can do so I would I don't want to daunt you on that. I think it's definitely doable. I've already run the plugin in IDA because it's really slow in IDA. So I didn't want to run that live. So that's one place where Binary Ninja works for whatever reason. It might just be because we didn't optimize our code or something. It might have been something we did wrong. But it seemed like it ran a lot faster in Binary Ninja. In particular, they, they include support for threading. So we could have made it even faster in Binary Ninja if we had used threading, which we didn't. But it was still a lot faster there. And if you look at the place where uh, these D words, these data addresses, there's nothing there by default. Because statically, when you look at a data section of an executable, it's like, oh, this data hasn't been initialized. It could because it doesn't happen until runtime. So there's nothing there to look at. But we were able to leave comments there that basically say, this is close handle, or this is create process, or this is exit process. Whatever the APIs are, we kind of just named them in comments in IDA Pro. So that was how this thing runs when it when it executes. It's it's not really um, too exciting. And I will show you how it runs inside Binary Ninja. Whoops, let me just minimize this. There's Binary Ninja. You can just take the file, you can just drop it on Binary Ninja, it'll open it up, and you can right click, and you can click on the plugin that you've written. Now you have to have put, in, put this plugin beforehand into the plugins folder and obviously it has to be working and tested. So I've already done all that. So I'm kind of hiding you from the messy details, if you will. But once, the, once all that's working, then you can just click Resolve API calls. And let me go to the, uh, the function where this happens first. So, so when I run it, you should see there's a slight delay and then you should see some of those data terms get renamed. I don't know if you just saw it change or not, but this thing here got a comment after it, and this this was data underscore whatever, and now it says close handle. So we just, what you could have done manually by hitting N and calling it, renaming it manually, we just wrote a script that does that for you. 
And we found that it was doable for either one, both Ida and Binary Ninja. Writing the script was, um, you know, there were enough examples and stuff out there in documentation for both uh, tools that we could write a script that worked on either one. So uh, there's that. It, I don't know if it was necessarily way easier or way harder on either one. There were some uh, benefits one way or the other uh, that were interesting. One thing I want to do, too, since I haven't done this yet, I just kind of talked through it and kind of glossed through it. If you, One of the ways that you want to learn reverse engineering is just take a simple C program. Like here, I've got a, a C++ program just called board.cpp. It's just some C++ program. It's nothing really exciting. Um, just take that, compile it. And once you've compiled it and you have an executable, um, then you can just open it up in IDA Pro, which I've already done. I've already have an IDB that I open and save it. So just drop that on the IDA Pro icon or right-click it. And you'll see that IDA did a good job. I don't know if you can read this or not, but it started me in the main program. Can you read that? Yeah, you can kind of read that maybe if you have good vision. And if you look down through, it did a pretty good job of like resolving some of the common library functions like ADY. And it even did a pretty good job of when this, when the constructor for the uh, main object is called, it shows board colon colon board, which is the C++ syntax for initializing that object, basically. And you can see that in the code. So the way you learn reverse engineering is you write some code. Here's the ADY, ADY. So this line of C++ code, maps to like this block of assembly basically and that's how you learn this you go oh that's how that looks and you kind of go back and forth and that's kind of how you learn this whole thing so let's see what does it look like in binary ninja if we take that same program board.exe and throw it in binja um, it doesn't find main right because it's not quite as good at that especially on windows so we'll have to find that it's probably uh, one of these it's actually this is another function after start that calls main. So here I see a I see a move 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 call, which I just happen to recognize as essentially main. So this is main. So you could type n and call this main and rename it. So once you find it, I mean it's not terribly difficult if you're good at this, you could find it yourself. But it was nice that I'd have found it for me. Um, if you look for that same block, the A to Y, A to Y. I like how they put the MSVCRT bang A to Y. So they show you what what DLL. Not just the API name, but they give you the DLL as well. I like that. That's a little different than what Ida did, so that's kind of cool. You can read that. If you can't, let's see if I can zoom in. Let's see. I'll probably fail on this epically. How do I zoom? Yeah. So you can you can take like this, and you can zoom in and out and make this as big as I want. And then what it didn't do, though, the constructor, this is that board, colon, colon, board. It didn't do anything with that. It's not able to parse, like, the PDB symbols or anything, the names or the imports or a lot of the stuff that Ida is a little better at pulling that apart and automatically renaming functions. It didn't do that. So, you know, you take the good with the bad. I expect it will improve a lot over the next year. So, you know, that's one of those things. It may not do this right this second, but a year from now, it's still going to be cheaper than Ida, and it's going to have a lot of this. So keep watching it, keep following it, um, you know, keep... Keep your eye on it uh, because I think it's pretty pretty solid tool, even though it doesn't have every little thing just yet. All right, so kick back over to um, the script. So this was the binge script, and this bit here, this get function at, that's kind of how we get started to access the assembly. And from there, we can do this for block in main dot low level IL, and we can begin to walk through all of the blocks in the main IL. So that's kind of how you get started on that. You iterate through the blocks. And then the rest of that, as I said, I'll leave that to an exercise for the reader. That's where we check for the API calls. That's kind of the logic that does the, the hashing. The IDA script looks fairly similar. We have this area here where you do four segments in segments, and then four functions in those segments. And then you can do four head in all the different heads to iterate the block. So the, the logic is a little different as far as the APIs and the way you access the internal database that both of these tools expose to the reverse engineer, the, the extension writer. But ultimately, the logic where you do the check for the API call is somewhat similar. One subtle difference that was interesting was the fact that the IL allows you to directly access registers at any point. So it's really nice in Binary Ninja to be able to say main dot get reg value at I want ESI. And you can get the value at ESI at that point. And now you've got what was the API hash source. So that was we needed that piece of data for this script, whatever it is. And it was really easy to access. 
And Ida was very accessible as well, but you had to do just a little bit more work with the APIs to kind of finagle that data out. It wasn't as straightforward to say, give me the value at ESI. You kind of had to walk backwards a little bit and find the value from a certain point. So I feel like you could screw that up easier in, in Ida because they don't directly access uh, registers. So uh, one of the things that you can do in Binja that's also really nice that doesn't work quite as well in, in Ida is you can run this script just from the command line. You can do python resolve api's.py so you can get this, you can headless without the GUI basically you can run these scripts. So having a true batch mode is really nice if you want to run this across a thousand different malwares or something. You don't have to open up the malware and the GUI and kind of you know manually right click each one and stuff. The headless option is really awesome. So the code that we make available is on GitHub uh, slash VDA Labs and DerbyCon, Binary Ninja. That's where I first released it. I was, I was at Derby. So and the docs, the, bin, the Binja docs and the Ida docs are both there if you want to go and find the data associated with this. And congratulations, you did it. Uh, that's my best. That was my best buddy, the elf voice. So I don't know. I'm not very good at that voice. But if you want to contact me on Twitter, I'm at Jared Demott, uh, info at either Binary Defense or VDA Labs, depending on you know what company you want to get a hold of, you can find me there. And that's all I have. But I do have a dinosaur still and some cards. So if anybody wants to come up after, uh, that's the end of the talk. So go ahead and applause. We'll cut it there, and then you can uh, you guys can come up after if you want to grab a card or something. And I'll give this to whoever comes up with the first question. So thank you.